Um, so right. today, I'm being joined by Nicola Lees, who is the director and curator at ADWSE, uh, which is part under the pedagogical wing of the Steinhardt School at NYU. Um, and I'm also being joined by Laura Busby, who is the program assistant at RAMP, and who will also be attending NYU for museum administration in a couple of weeks. Um, so perhaps as some professional development before she goes into the world of grad school, I'm actually going to have her sort of navigate this conversation. Um, and Nicola will be telling us a lot about uh, the sort of philosophy behind um, ADWSE and, and how it works. Um, well, I'll, I'll let her explain that. <laughs> so, Laura, Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Nicola, hi. Thank you so very much for hosting this session. We're really thrilled to have you here. Uh, the title of the talk is Institution as Material, so I imagine we'll unpack that as we go along with the questions that we have for you. So we'll get started. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the philosophy of ADWSE and the institution's relationship with NYU? So the gallery is um, in what is located in Washington Square East. Um, we're on the ground floor of a building that was built in 1876. Um, and we have, as many um, of you who know this part of uh, New York City, it is actually the original building, which is a bit of an anomaly. Many buildings have sort of morphed and changed as the city has. Um, it was originally built as housing for bachelors. Um, so, the re and we are next door to um, 79 Washington Square East, which was also originally a hotel built at the same time, which is a halls of residence. So we really, um, and the bachelors, um, the idea of housing for bachelors was a very brief moment in New York City. Not that it wasn't successful, but um, they weren't great tenants. Um, so they often found it hard to rent in the city, um, but it wasn't unsurprising that the bachelors also happened to be artists, architects, writers, mm -hmm. and very much part of that bohemian moment um, in the late um, and to early 19th century. Um, and I think that it's also um, interesting to sort of, we always want to sort of keep that relationship with the building sort of being a space where artists were inhabiting the space and keeping it as a living, breathing um, gallery where um, we're thinking about process rather than product. Um, and, and as part of that, which we'll talk about a bit more, thinking about the institution as a space of process. Um, there's another connection. Um, there are two main galleries at NYU. Um, we're very close to each other geographically. So we're number 80, Washington Square East. Um, and the Gray Art Gallery is number 100, Washington Square. Um, they're technically the NYU Museum, um, even though we both also have um, crossovers and focuses on contemporary art practice. Um, and the Gray also really navigate, we work a little bit with them on this, but they really navigate the NYU art collection across all the campuses. We also have galleries in Shanghai and Abu Dhabi and all, all of our international locations as well. Um, and so we sort of see ourselves much more as um, connected to the art school and uh, the art administration and curatorial practice. Mm -hmm. So we really have a focus on, on contemp contemporary art um, and, and thinking about the artists at the center of all of our activities here at 80 Washington Square East. Um, there is another sort of historical relationship where um, one of the founders of NYU, Gallatin, had a nephew, A.E. Gallatin, who set up the Museum for Living Art, um, which was also between 1927 and 1947. And that was actually one of the first spaces in New York where sort of um, living also sort of European modernism was um, coming to the city with um, sort of Picasso and Art and Mondrian, you know, even just before the birth of the Whitney and MoMA. Um, and so there is this really dynamic history of art at NYU, even though, um, again, the, the Museum of, of Living Art didn't really become a sort of permanent museum. 
and much of that collection has ended up in Philadelphia. So, so for us, it's really like taking that history of, of really thinking about working with the, the new generation on an international level um, and then taking risks as well. So for us, it's really about not presenting something that's, that's polished or finished for the market or for a museum exhibition and like sharing what it means to sort of, of make, to make new work if we yeah not to sound sort of too not to make it that complicated either <laughs> yeah so that's like a little bit about the history of the space and how we sort of think about um the beginnings of how we approach our conversations um the gallery architecturally is actually six seven individual spaces that all connect into each other so um we we do often mainly do solo exhibitions with artists um ranging from Dwayne Linklater who is a Canadian artist who Laura knows very well um, <laughs> and um, that was one of the first exhibitions that happened when I moved to New York City um and for us Dwayne is an artist who also has a very important activist and pedagogical projects including the Woodland School and rethinking how we can address indigenous art histories. And um, uh, so for us, it was very important in that context to, to give Dwayne a solo exhibition, really um, thinking about making new work with him. And um, also um, addressing uh, at that time, you know, the, the opening up the conversation of contemporary art beyond um, to other departments in NYU. Um, so we worked a lot with museum studies, thinking about um, issues around copyright and ownership of objects in museums. Um, we worked a lot with um, the law department also at NYU. We had the um, Native American Indigenous student group in residence with us for a whole year. So that was, was like an example of how we sort of come from a contemporary art focus but then we were sort of entering into more conversations around the pipeline and um, decolonize this place and all of those other more um, activist and academic conversations. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of collaboration and advocacy and dealing with a lot of big issues right now. I mean, it's not just, um, you know, exhibition space. It's really big conversations going on. Yeah. We worked a lot with Columbia at that time, and we had a big conference around that exhibition as well. And there were lots of different academic papers that were generated through that conversation. And normally we're working with artists over 18 months to three years. So with that process of also thinking about making new work, the actual sort of building and construction of the exhibition. So with Dwayne, we actually removed all the interior walls of the gallery and the work is now sort of been built in and is now sort of actually hidden behind the walls of the gallery, not without over explaining the exhibition. So that work is sort of still here in many ways. Um, and then we often work with artists for another year or so after the exhibition. So often when we're making new work, we don't always know exactly what it's going to be. So that we have conversations and audience development during the exhibition's life. Um, but then we're often really thinking about documentation and processing that work for like another six, eight, nine months after the exhibition, as well as, yeah. So it's it's not just about sort of a six week moment for us. It's like about building a community over time um, and really thinking about what is sort of urgent and necessary in New York City, which is something that you were touching upon there about what conversations are interesting and fruitful um, and also can sort of open up process and um, off offer a sort of uh, a sort of non-commercial non sort of museum institution glance at, at process and art making. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I just want to mention we're going to be recording this and we'll have this up on our website um, but when we do that I'd also love to include any resources that you have any of this documentation and some of the examples of projects that you want to share with everyone and that ties into anything that you might mention in our discussion today. So yeah. we'll, we will ask you for some of those resources and we'll try and have those available for people when they watch. Yeah. Uh, 
thank you for that. <laughs> We're actually building a new website at the moment, which is going to be launched mid-September. So it's also a really productive time for us to be rethinking about how we document and, and create oh, wonderful around those exhibitions. Um, for example, when we made the Haran Faraki um, program we did last year, it was actually, we've made a sort of almost a 300 page publication, but we made that, we made 18 pages a week through. So for us, it was like structured as a four week class mm -hmm. uh, that came together and um, met every Sunday actually at Anthology Film Archive to like watch films and talk about the work. But then for us, it's sort of breaking down the process of what it means to make a publication, tying into like educational formats. So yeah, so like this kind of idea of a class, um, the idea of a reader, and then we're using the mechanisms, for example, of uh, library binding, so that we'll, in a, in a sort of print on demand sense, that then we'll make sort of 10, 20, 30 copies of those publications potentially for libraries and thinking and read um, and different sort of ports of uh, distribution, mm -hmm. which is very different to um, with the Backers exhibition last summer, we made a publication, which was really the second part of the exhibition. So for us, sometimes the publications are artist books and are more of a sort of thinking about um, the book as a sort of gallery space. Mm -hmm. and those publications, we then work with international publishers such as Koenig, so that it's really about making a very ambitious artwork that can tour and travel around the world. Um, yeah. Oh, that's exciting. I'd like, yeah, I'd love to see some of this. Mm -hmm. Did you want to ask any? Yeah. Questions or um, did you want to tell us a little bit more about how you go about building an exhibition? Um, again, for us, I think the main thing is that we really look at it as a two, three year project. Um, and that is also really thinking about having a uh, research and development as part of a university context, but for contemporary artists, that that is really like being able to support that process both financially through fellowships, um, through um, gathering resources. So there's often some exhibitions are more sort of heavy on the sort of academic brain research, we would say, and others are much heavier on like film production, sort of actors sets, um, sort of in a, in a, so those exhibitions tend to sort of balance each other out. Um, so, I, it's sort of, every, but then every project we do is completely different, which is why I'm hesitating because <laughs> there isn't like what, so in a way for us, like thinking about how we can be as flexible as possible mm -hmm. to suit the project or the artists we're working with rather than us having a way of working. So that's where the institution as material also comes into play. Mm -hmm. So for example, the exhibition we have up at the moment, which is by a film collective called 13 BC. Um, and they, the exhibition is called Fatal Act. And within that we've um, fundraised and been able to really make a feature length film that was shot in Nevada, between Nevada and Utah on the border. It looks at the history of uh, Gunter Anders, who is an important um, anti-nuclear activist and philosopher He's not so well known because he's uh, mainly was only translated into from German into French and Italian. Um, but he's also sort of known because he's Hannah Arendt's uh, first husband and had many jobs like he was a janitor in a prop house in Hollywood. So he has this sort of huge understanding of the film, the sort of structure of the film world in um, in Los Angeles from a sort of much more blue collar position rather than an academic um, proposition. And um, it's about his uh, correspondence with Claude Etherly, who is the pilot who gave the all clear when they dropped the bomb in Hiroshima. Um, so we, there, there's a 17 minute script that was produced through about 18 months of research. Um, there was a fundraising process to raise um, the money to make that film. Um, and so we really became a film production house for four or five months last year. 
Um, we were, you know, hiring generators, dealing with quite insurance and in off location, um, working with the Screen Actors Guild, um, and and so our whole way of working completely shifted. And then the exhibition is actually, in many ways, a relatively simple install. It's never simple, but um, you know. So for that example, all of the work sort of happened four or five months before the exhibition. Whereas when we've done exhibitions, like Dora Boudoir's exhibition was very installation heavy and it was also a completely new work. So the majority of that, um, in, even though there was a huge amount of research again before the exhibition, was really physical work within the gallery, mm -hmm. permanently changing the architecture of the space that we work in, shifting the way we organize ourselves, just in terms of um, how the office is, like what the reception area looks like, and a lot of these changes then remain. So the gallery is also slowly um, changing both physically and, and uh, sort of curatorially. So we're trying each time to rethink how we work Mm -hmm. and allow the artists that we work with, whether it's students, faculty, or these sort of international sort of artists to really think about how they can change us rather than us trying to ask them to fit into a format or a formula that is a way that we work. Yeah, it sounds like you're constantly, you know, like an artist experimenting in new media um, yeah. and, and creating your own content even around that and sort of playing with, I mean, it sounds like you're kind of in collaborating with the artists as a curator, does that? Yes, I think collaboration is such, a, is, is a very interesting way of thinking about it. I mean, for us, it's like, um, it's like as an organization, we want to try and um, think about how we can work with, um, uh, yeah, intergenerational artists, artists that sort of often also have practices that maybe sit slightly outside of what we would consider a more traditional market structure. Or um, and um, and then for us, if we want to work with artists that don't necessarily sort of always uh, that have sort of slightly uh, have a huge range of. Of, of techniques and ways of working that then for us it's important that we're as flexible as possible mm -hmm. which kind of comes back to thinking about the gallery as a living space um, and it's and a living museum which in in many ways goes back to like um i worked at the serpentine gallery for a long time um as a senior curator with hans Ulrich, and we often he would refer to alexander dorner and who was one of the so, and the Hanover Museum, but really also a lot of the work he did with Buckminster Fuller and thinking about the Living Museum. So, which is really also many different ways of thinking about how we can be as flexible as possible, how we can always be changing, changing the rules of the game, as like Richard Hamilton would say. So always just thinking about, and then for us, it's really important that, I mean, not that we really, not that everyone we work with is technically an artist, like, um, with the Louise Lawler show, she collaborated with Ray Anassas and Robert Snowdens, who are like maybe more traditionally art historians and curators. And we're often rethinking how we uh, uh, look at the hierarchy of the art world. So um, Jason Harata, who has the show next December at the gallery, has done an exhibition which is a solo show, but it will also be thinking around, um, but it will in many ways appear as a group exhibition because it's an exhibition of all the works he's made for other people. So it also thinking about what it means for artists to um, make work and how those relationships are very broad. And, and, and again, thinking about what these terms like collaboration can mean in different scenarios. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so we're always trying to think about that and also not necessarily have a specific way of working. I mean, we're not completely chaotic, but um, it's not, we, and we have timelines in our minds, but it's also like uh, rethinking what it means to, um, like it's not that we sort of um, 
write the press release in the same way each time we do an exhibition or have a similar invite or um, have a, a structure that we necessarily want to repeat. So we're always sort of as much space as we can as possible. Some exhibitions are very heavy in terms of um, long uh, sort of exhibition labels and others mm -hmm. uh, have very minimal information. And so we're always sort of, obviously when the exhibition has less uh, written information, maybe there's more of a discuss, then there's more of a hosting that has to happen mm -hmm. in the space and more conversations that can happen. Um, but within that, I think we could, people become interested because they don't necessarily know what, we're, what will happen next. Mm -hmm. um, and all the exhibitions sort of architecturally potentially look very different. Um, so again, we, we don't want to often over publicize what something will look and see and feel like because we want people to come and experience it. So there's sort of always a fine line between communicating and, and not over communicating, but building a community through word of mouth mm -hmm. has also been very important. It's like a lot of work, but for us, it's a very important strategy. And you can tell people are curious when they walk by. They're always peering through the window. Like for example, right now, it's pitch black inside. It is pitch black inside. Which <laughs> is not the easiest working environment. You're in a very bright room. Uh, if you could, you sort of, you touched on this earlier. You worked with Columbia earlier on. If you could talk about ADWC's relationship with other academic institutions. Um, where we're located geographically in the city, I mean, we have, at the moment, we do also have a lot of walk-ins, which is incredible. And Washington Square is like, I think, yeah, there's thousands and thousands of people in this area. Um, but the targeted audience development, we really have been in touch with, we've tried to be in touch with all of the art professors, like, primarily, like, in the area and then in New York City. And we're really inviting, so we really see that as, one of like maybe a third of our core audience so for us like we love classes to come and sometimes professors just bring their classes sometimes we host the classes sometimes we are um the classes happen here and we're generating the classes um so we do think of ourselves as a teaching gallery in that respect um we're often also teaching at other spaces as a way of encouraging the students to feel to understand that we also have a very relaxed atmosphere here. We're wanting it to be a sort of, also feel like a playful space as much as it can. Um, and sort of trying to have it, we have openings every Wednesday night, for example. So also making it feel very open and um, exciting. Um, but at the moment we're actually collaborating with Harvard University on the, the Atlas Unlimited exhibition, which will open in October and also with the Chicago University um, Gallery as well on that exhibition. Um, the exhibition we have up at the moment is touring to um, the Douglas Hyde Gallery in Dublin, which is Trinity University's main gallery, which is this incredible, brutalist building. And it's actually um, in the center of Dublin, and it's one of the most important contemporary art spaces in, in Dublin. Um, and that's really exciting for us as well, because, I mean, they have a similar, I mean, a lot of these university galleries, we've been here since 1974. Um, and, and the focus here has always been contemporary art, actually, uh, at ATWSE. Um, and that's the same at the Douglas Hyde Gallery as well. They've sort of been around since the mid 70s. Um, they mainly focus on international exhibitions, some tours, some don't, and also thinking about making new work within the environment of the university. So for us, we're always looking at, to that, but then at the same time, we want to sort of uh, also have a role in New York City where we can, we work closely with other nonprofit organizations, mm -hmm. which, um, which are maybe a similar sort of footprint and scale, maybe some are a bit larger, but so we work a lot with the Swiss Institute, um, we work a lot with artist space um, and sometimes crossover also with white columns. And so we're also for us, that's part of that's also audience development, part of it's collaborating and many different forms that that can take. Um, 
And I'm really thinking about how we can like offer uh, artists either visiting or living and working in the city a space where they can feel sort of op yeah optimistic potentially is like the broadest most basic way of saying it but like um sort of a space that um has has a potential as well that it doesn't fit into the sort of um more traditional formats yeah and it's actually um you're talking a little bit about other institutions that you collaborate with and we have a question from our guest olivia who i know quite well hello olivia um and she's also wondering... nyu <laughs> also nyu yes um <laughs> she says hello hello um, yeah she was well, wondering you... if you could sorry um, which department at nyu do we know i do not Gosh. remember at the moment <laughs> museum studies program okay great yeah yeah. So yeah, Olivia Canal. She used to actually be our our former program assistant oh, okay. for Laura, and uh, hopefully they will all meet each other at some point. Um, but she was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the fundraising process for the gallery, and whether it works closely with the development department at NYU. Um, NYU is a very complicated organization. Um, we are part of Steinhardt. So um, we work closely with Steinhardt um, and within that we, we work, for example, we work closely with Steinhardt's individual giving department, mm -hmm. but NYU for, would also have, um, it depends on the funding application. So also if anything's related, there's a, there's a department which is more of a general NYU department that works with us if we're doing any more government funding. Mm -hmm. applications and there is uh and then some things we're allowed to work independently on mm -hmm. so um we often a lot of it is also about we research potential funding opportunities and then um share that information and gather um resources and also permissions to apply for different grants because NYU is such a big organization this is, there is a streamlining process mm -hmm. um and we're a very small team so there's always the and also because it we're coming up to some funding deadlines in September as everyone probably is but um so it's always a push and pull between focusing on fundraising and also focusing on the, because we're only a team of three, really, um, mm -hmm. with student workers. So um, it's always, there is always the question of like, when it's worth fundraising and the probabilities of it being successful versus um, a huge amount of time and resource going into something that maybe is, is, is not necessarily going to be as productive for us time-wise. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that really answers the question. I mean, the answer is yes, but uh, it's complicated. <laughs> oh, she says that helps. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I also want to let you know, we had a, a message earlier um, from someone at the Gray Art Gallery, Lucy Oakley. Um, and she said, thank you for mentioning NYU's Gray Art Gallery and A.E. Gallatin, whose gallery and museum of living art was in the space where the Gray is now located. It was on that, yeah, yeah. Next, on that land, yeah. So yeah, we have a lot of NYU people here today. <laughs> <laughs> the special club. Yep. Um, if you could also tell us a little bit about your touring exhibitions. Sorry, it just reminded me also because Lucy, who's so amazing, was hosting also the Soho Art Network at the Grey Art Gallery. So that's another part of our broader outreach as well, which Lucy does much more successfully than we do at the moment but so it's also like just not only the not-for-profits I mentioned but also really thinking about all the other institutions in this area which is such an interesting and fascinating area mm -hmm. and also um yeah and, and, and even for me for example like one of the most exciting things sometimes is, is really even just if we're on the NYU newsletter um that's a moment when I get phone calls from like the medieval poetry department wanting to bring a class because so it's, we don't want it always to be a focus on contemporary artists and um, thinking about that. But for us, we also want to really feel like a, a hub for all of those young students in the area to be able to come to our openings and meet each other as well. So this, yeah, it's always overlapping. Mm -hmm. 
I think my computer's going up. Lucy is saying you can learn more about the Gray's history and Gallatin on the Gray's website. <laughs> and you have a fan club. <laughs> <laughs> and Andrew Weiner, who's one of the professors in our department, also runs a really amazing, it's called the Contemporary Art Research Collective, I think. Um, and we're part of that. So there's so many different ways that we sort of reach out. And that's more also curators and art professionals sort of across New York City and, and, in, and also sort of um, universities across both internationally and, and locally. So there's so many resources that we tap into. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have one dedicated staff member to help us do more of the pedagogical outreach, which is a goal that we have, mm -hmm. hopefully. That's the one thing we're looking to have. Um, if we could have a bit one more full time member of staff, that's that would be ideal in some ways in terms of outreach. Sorry, Laura, you asked me a question. I lost track. No, that was great. Uh, I can imagine it's with that ambitious schedule you have, so it would be helpful to have more help. <laughs> uh, my question was about touring exhibitions, if you want to speak into a little bit about that. Um, it's not, I mean, again, it changes depending on, on the type of work and with, we, we toured to with the main exhibitions we've toured was um, the uh, Dream of Salentanami exhibition, um, which was mainly focused on um, artists, political artists in, in Nicaragua from the 1960s to the present day. And that went to the Humex Museum in Mexico City after. So we originated the exhibition and that toured. And then um, we also, this exhibition, and because it's a film, it's sort of, it's a sort of different touring format is going to be going to Dublin um, to the Douglas High Gallery, like I mentioned. But the one thing about how we try and conceive touring and collaborating is also really through co-commissioning work. So um, and that has for some more traditional models, for example, if you're making a film, maybe you would have five organizations. Um, not all necessarily galleries, but would put maybe a certain amount of money into a pot and you'd be able to make a film and everyone would maybe show that in different locations or format. But the thing we're trying to, to do is think about um, that as really like extending the research process and, the, um, and thinking about how the artist is making work and how work sort of functions. So actually the collaboration we have now with Harvard and the University of Chicago is uh, sort of been, is an exhibition that's been happening since around 2011, 2012, which is by Karthik Pandian, who's a contemporary art professor at Harvard, and um, Andrew Sins Brown, who's a very um, incredible choreographer and dancer and um, artist based in New York City. Um, and that exhibition originated in Brussels. And so with that, it's almost like each exhibition becomes a chapter or an act in a much bigger mm -hmm. project. Um, so the exhibition we have here will be completely different to the other iterations. It won't look the same. It's been completely rewritten. Um, but at the same time, it's part of an ongoing conversation and dialogue. Um, and sometimes um, I've seen artists like Callie Spooner, who's um, someone I've worked with a lot in the past at the Serpentine. And actually when I did Freeze Projects, a lot of the um, commissions we would make would also be about supporting a chapter in that in a, in the in that process, which would be maybe me making helping artists make part of a bigger film project or an installation. Or um, we worked with Nick Mouse very early on on a ballet commission in 2015 in London, and that evolved over a long period of time to a, actually more of a collections live collections exhibition at the Whitney. So often things completely change form, thinking and format. Um, so it's not really a traditional tour, it's just really igniting and supporting research. And he was actually then in residence at NYU um, in the Department of Dance for a whole year doing a fellowship. So again, that would even be a project that originated in London, became a fellowship as part of a university and an exhibition in a museum. And actually Dora Bidor would be another example of an artist we worked with over a very long period of time. Um, and she recently, has the summer exhibition at the Basel Kunsthal in, um, in Switzerland. Um, and so there are lots of crossovers with the work that we've done, even though both exhibitions were completely site-specific. 
So in a way, the exhibition we did, because it was so much about the architecture of the building and the history of NYU, um, and the exhibition she did in Basel is so much about the history of the building and, and the relationship of that building in terms of the, in Basel as a city, architecturally. Um, the sort of mechanisms and structures of those exhibitions kind of fed into each other and bled and like overlap. So I think it's, that's another way of thinking about it because how can you tour a site specific exhibition? It's not really possible. So for us, it's, that's where the long-term work comes in, which is just about research. And often I work with artists, which is about shifting um, their practice. So, I mean, for example, Nick Mouse hadn't really, um, never liked to be like oh the first to do this or whatever but like he, he it was the first time he'd really had the opportunity to work with dancers and produce a live piece so who's someone who'd mainly come from painting and drawing so also, also with dora it was the first time that she really took on these much larger installation projects so for us that like, often it's about thinking about how artists can also um change the way they work sometimes it's momentary and sometimes it has a much longer impact so yeah uh, we have another question here from Tammy. When did you join ADWSE? I arrived here three three years ago, almost exactly. Maybe ten, yeah. In in about ten, I arrived on the twenty fifth of August. Um, and before me, there was an incredible director here who's also on faculty called Jonathan Berger, who was an artist. I mean, he is an artist. No, he wasn't. He's, he's now actually going to have the next exhibition at the at Harvard um, with uh, with Dan. So, like, it's really exciting that he's also now mainly focused on his solo practice. But um, he'd done incredible exhibitions at AT since about 2013, 2012 to 2016. And we crossed over with an exhibition by Ellen Cantor, who's a really incredible artist, uh, which was actually in collaboration with MoMA and, and Participant Inc. and lots of other spaces in New York City. Um, and then prior to that, Peter Campus had been the director of the gallery, who is a very important um, experimental filmmaker. So we have a lot of film, old, old film, not that old, we have a lot of film equipment in the basement. And so as part of our community, we also share that resource um, with, well, obviously with students and the exhibitions here, but often with our collaborating spaces and, 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 um, uh, and other um, community groups that we work with, including like Queer Thoughts Gallery, who are in residence with us, they're often rummaging in the basement for things. And That's great. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned students or you're wanting to bring in classes to the spaces and with all of the different kinds of exhibitions exhibitions that you you showcase and as a site for commissions how what are some tools and strategies for developing audiences or audience engagement um i think the the strategy that doesn't really make any sense is sometimes um because we're such a small team, sometimes we're, we, like, we don't, like, doesn't always make that much sense. We don't do that much social media, um, partly because it's incredibly time consuming. I mean, people think it takes no time, but actually when you're really thinking about how it relates to a program and an exhibition in a space. Um, we're building a, a new website, which I don't know if that's really going to change in terms of, like, dynamic and mediums, but that's more of an archival resource. So a lot of the outreach we do is um, being in touch with professors across the city, as I was saying earlier, um, and really trying to build a community through word of mouth, which is, we're lucky because of the location in New York with us and the Gray, that we're really sort of in the center of the city. Um, so we're able to have this crossover between the university community and also the sort of larger public. Um, so that's always something we're working on and how we use, we have a lot of window galleries as well. So how we use them to like draw different attention to the space. Um, but it's always a bit of a push and pull between trying to build an atmosphere in a community that um, has a natural and organic um, increase in audience 
Um, I think we, we have like almost doubled or tripled the audience over, over the last three or four years, um, which is also thinking about how we foster outside of the university as well as, as, as inside the immediate community. So um, that's always like a complicated conversation. And, um, and, and I think it's very difficult these days navigating social media and having the pressure to sort of focus on that so much and, and then really thinking about whether it's the most productive space. Um, so a lot of the work we do in that sense is really invisible, <laughs> which is also sometimes very hard when you're um, plugging, as Lucy will know, you're plugging away um, day by day. Uh, yeah, but I, I think it's, um, so in a way, I, w I wish we had more of a concise strategy. I mean, that is something that we are thinking about, like now that we're entering into the sort of the next three years. Um, and um, and sometimes that is through the fact that each um, exhibition is quite different. So, um, I mean, in terms of, I mean, we're all focused on contemporary art, but in terms of like the Louise Lawler show, was also really wanting to think about contemporary, bringing up into conversation with photography as well as, um, the filmmaking that we're doing and, and ambitious installations and also like more historical exhibitions occasionally. And then in terms of exhibition programming, what about talks or tours on the floor programming such as those? It's another question from the side box here. Um, I have done in my career I've done a huge amount of conferences and talks and um, public programming um, at NYU it's interesting because actually in comparison to the Serpentine at the immediate community at NYU have a huge amount of lectures so and often those lectures are also at night so sometimes it's for us it's quite complex in terms of if we just we we recently did a talk with Freeze magazine um, and we had a great audience, but I realized that the majority of the Steinhardt students were actually in class that <laughs> evening. So I was like, it's hard when people are like just double booked by the same institution. Um, so we vary it a lot. So with the Louise Lawler show, we ended up host, we actually hosted a class that was um, taught by Ray Anassas about Louise Lawler's practice thinking about all of the ways that she um, has participated in, in in engaging with or not engaging with institutions as well. And um, so that was like, a, you know, a very focused group of people that were here every week for 14 weeks. And I think also um, then doing the Haran Faroki project at Anthology, we were able to completely cross over with the sort of very experimental fil film audience in New York City. So often by working with other organizations we do programming um and we host a lot of classes and maybe we do one or two talks for each exhibition mm. but we this exhibition for example is 138 minutes of film sort of essayist so i don't feel like that many people want to experience that and have too many talks on top mm -hmm. whereas other exhibitions are much more suitable for like Dwayne, ex Dwayne Linklater's exhibition, we had film screenings, um, weekly um, gatherings, and also more of a symposium, -y, yeah, panel discussions and symposiums. Um, so it really, again, it just really varies. We don't have, we don't think about doing a talk every Saturday or right. um, something once a month, which I have done in the past and that's also great. But um, here it, it, it slightly uh, changes all the time, which is also why we have to do so much audience development. <laughs> yeah. We have another question here from the University from North Alabama. Uh, what are some working challenges you have experienced collaborating with other academic divisions outside of the visual art and design? Can you offer some general advice? I, the most difficult example was interdisciplinary collaborations. I think, um, particularly with ballet, the hierarchy of how the hi different hierarchies can sometimes collide, different mm -hmm. ideas of authorship, so maybe, especially when you're trying to 
de-establish a certain hierarchy and then you're coming up against a more traditional um, organization. So I think that's where the most challenge has always been for me. Um, I think sometimes for us, the way people participate can be very different in terms of collaboration. So sometimes a collaboration partner, I'm talking about organizations rather than individuals potentially, would maybe help a lot with the research and development of something, whereas another collaborator might be sort of very cash rich and able to pay for things that we find difficult to muster up with speed and efficiency. Um, and then other partners is I was also just really thinking about the longevity of an exhibition. Um, I also think with touring shows, it's interesting often for artists to have to tour an exhibition once. I sometimes feel like if an exhibition is sort of on its fifth leg, Sometimes the artists can sort of feel a little, uh, they get a little tired of the piece and it sort of feels like, oh, we have to do this again. And which is why sometimes this idea of things changing and chapters reformatting is a way of collaborating without it sort of becoming a little, everyone has a chance to participate in the growth of something. And that's often like a much more exciting way of uh, thinking about that. And sometimes I'm very vague, but um, <laughs> I, uh, the other thing we're going to do with the new website, and this is also a collaboration with Chus Martinez, who's an amazing professor in, in Basel and curator, but I'm um, thinking about actually having a, so we're going to um, have maybe, which which is something we share in terms of, with other organizations and students, and but with a small group, like a seminar, is uh, having a back part to the website, which would have um, examples of our artist contracts. I mean, it's, some of that's about transparency. I'm not sure it's so interesting. Um, so often with commissioning, a lot of that is thinking about how things are written and, and having contracts that are not also too heavy and too aggressive. And, and, and also maybe contracts that are thinking about the artist, but maybe primarily in terms of how to make work. And, and, and again, that is like how commissioning and collaboration can be phrased within a uh, I guess sometimes I don't even, with America, I'm like maybe they're lists of agreements and contracts. Um, but also, like, that's where we would share more um, of our resources and information and, and more essays and reading material and, um, and other resources as well. So, for us, that's um, another way of thinking about how to be more transparent and uh, with how we're working um, without uh, having to talk about each individual project. Yeah, we would love to share those resources as well. I think they could be incredibly useful uh, for other folks to kind of look at and start thinking about. Um, and really the RAMP website, a lot of it is about providing resources for other folks in the academic museum community so that they can actually share things like this, things like guidelines, language, white papers, um, all sorts Contract. of different things. So that would be, yeah, wonderful. I also, because I originally worked at the Irish Museum of Modern Art, so, and then I went to the Serpentine Gallery, which is more of a kind of Kunst, Kunst, Brian Kunst Hall space because there's no collection. Mm -hmm. um, and then running the Freeze Foundation, which is a non-profit art commissioning platform. So in a way, the way we're sort of also drafting these contracts within the university context is also thinking about how we can relate also to how the commissioning process could cross over with future commercial um, mm -hmm. opportunities for the artist or how it can cross over also with like museums and collecting and thinking about how. So with Lutz Backer, her work is now in the K21 collection in Dusseldorf, which is really exciting. So the work that we're making, making is also entering museum collections. And so, but the, the way you draft a contract, you want to also um, create a relationship that's productive, but also something that can then um, look at all the different possible future outcomes as well. And we're really not contract heavy as well, so that also <laughs> that helps. And that's why others would probably find that so helpful because contractual language is so specific. It's like a dance between you and the institution and the artist, and that would be fantastic if you could ever make something like that available for yeah. others. Yeah. On the side here for the Gray's beautiful brain exhibition presenting drawings by 
I can't say this name, but we had, I went to University of British Columbia and we, we had an exhibition of his work. Yeah. Who, uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Thank you. <laughs> Father of modern neuroscience. It's a organized. really good book, actually. So if anyone didn't see the show, the publication's also really incredible. Yeah, the work is fantastic. The, the NYU Neuroscience Department is really great. And they also collaborate a lot with, we as part of Steinhardt, we also include the art therapy department, which is uh, yeah. very different to this beautiful collaboration. But um, I, yeah, they're a really amazing resource at NYU. Yeah, and in, in the past, um, in RAMP, we talked about a lot of these collaborations, including um, medical departments, along with museums. And there's actually a whole, it's a bit hidden right now, but a whole part of our website where we had compiled a few different programs in case any museums were interested in that. Um, yeah. But the, yeah, it, the, I, a great example we give is also when Thread Waxing did the collaboration or the exhibition with the Mutter Museums, which was a really late 90s New York sort of incredible thing. I mean, for us, um, sometimes we this, we have a slight we work um, yeah we have a slightly strange timeline that sometimes makes these very which is why this was such a great example but it's hard to achieve because it's like sometimes for us our timelines don't quite fit in with the academic timelines so for us that's always a challenge um, so often. Um, yeah, planning classes and planning exhibitions don't always, um, maybe a once a year, they come together. Because mm -hmm. um, we also host the MFA exhibitions here. So in the spring, which oh, okay. is, would be a very productive time in the academic calendar, we have a lot of student activity at the gallery. And then sometimes some of our main exhibitions are when during the summer or during the, fall, during the winter. So it's not when, so it's, that is something that is an ongoing challenge, I would say. The, the Gray is also very good at achieving on a much more long term. Well, as a future grad student, uh, if you could tell us, how do you create meaningful mentorship and curatorial opportunities for students? Um, we have a really great team of student workers at the gallery. Um, and that obviously changes depending on who's working here and the, the, their, their schedules. Um, but we have a great uh, track record as well of those students graduating. Um, uh, Maggie is now at the Chicago Architecture Biennials, the assistant curator there. The biennial is opening in, in October and she's someone who was a very important part of our community for two years. Um, and is now having her first big curatorial opportunity. So that's really exciting. Um, and then Jennifer went to the development department at MoMA um, and is still there. And um, Aless, who graduated about over a year ago, is now at the Jewish Museum in the um, development team. So with the art administration, um, as the art administration part of our department is so rich in terms of having um, some more of curatorial focused students and other students that are interested in getting into all the other aspects of museum um, um, work, work and labor. Um, and Constanza's just graduated and is now at Creative Time. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, and then some of our students stay within academia, which I, yeah. So we have, we have uh, a lot of them come back. They're still part of our community. Um, and we're really an, we're an open resource in that way. And we're a very small team, so everyone does a little bit of everything. So that's always like, that's how I learn. So I think it's always um, a great way to sort of have um, a well-rounded uh, experience. And, and a lot of the students work with us for a year or over a year. Um, and I'm sure that's probably very similar to other university galleries. Um, I think that the students are probably um, a very core part of the team. And um, the architecture of the gallery, I also set up, I mean, our, my office is very much at the front of the gallery. So um, we're all sort of sort of visible. And, and um, I have an open door policy unless I'm on a deadline. <laughs> so yeah, so we're, um, yeah. 
I I don't really have a huge sort of explanation about mentorship. I mean, I know that um, uh, someone once said you you should have three. There are three different types of mentors. There's um there's more of a peer group mentorship, which I think actually being a student at somewhere like NYU really offers you the opportunity to meet your generation, your peer groups, and you can talk to your peers and um, offer guidance and advice and collaboration. And I also feel like um, here we're trying to have a very intergenerational program, but um, I sort of often look at my peer group as um, still as a huge resource. Um, and then there's um, the mentorships within the organizations that you really want to sort of also be able to sort of share. We have this incredible um, public art group at NYU, um, well, which includes, um, I think it, it includes Lynn from the Gray is really leading that and Bruce Alshuler and um, Edward Sullivan. So that's also another incredible sort of, uh, sort of for me to have mentors that are sort of like working in that way that I get to sort of understand um, a bit more about how the university works and how what the university's vision of, of contemporary art is. And then everyone needs a mentor that they can tell everything to. So it's the met you maybe student so then the mentor that you can sort of phone up when you're sort of uh, have some concerns about something or you're um, often when you're every project is slightly different and slightly new and that they're able to guide you through a process. So, um, yeah, and I, I definitely am very lucky that I have, I have that person in my life still. Um, and, um, and sometimes I hope that I can be that resource for this, the, the student workers that are graduating or the students that I know, mm -hmm. um, that they can also come here and ask for guidance. Um, and that's also the MFA students and the BA students and, um, so we, we have an open door in that sense. Um, we don't really offer advice, but we'll, um, yeah. That sounds great. We have another question here. Your philosophy for assessment, uh, for measuring the success? Um, that's complicated. I mean, we are always thinking about how we approach things. Um, I, it's, we actually generate quite a lot of press and reviews, which is always very helpful. Um, and, but at the same time with artists and the institution, I don't always think that that is the only, um, I think sometimes that's something that people put a lot of focus on. And I, that's not always the most, like sometimes something can be incredibly successful and is not written about in the same, like because it produces a huge word of mouth and mm -hmm. generates a whole different framework for how we can think about working. Um, and then other times things are sort of successful in a traditional way that you're like, oh, the numbers, the numbers increased. We had lots of press. Um, we had a lot of outreach at NYU. Um, and I feel like if you get too focused on numbers and um, reviews, it can, you can sometimes be, uh, it can stop you from wanting to take risk, mm -hmm. wanting to be a space that's not about um, success. It's about process. It's, it's about creating a space where, um, I don't really talk, sometimes I, yeah, I have a lecture where I talk about what it means to give an artist a deadline. And that is really a way of not talking about failure, but like not um, talking about how things, yeah, not thinking about, yeah, being able to think about things slightly differently. Mm -hmm. That sometimes what you're trying to achieve isn't what the outcome is and or the other way around. Yeah, there's lots of different examples, but uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, it, it's always something that I, I think it's also the Soho Art Network's great because recently, which Lucy would have seen, people were sharing their audience figures and it was just, yeah, sharing resources is another interesting way of even, because even though you might be tracking this yourself, you don't necessarily know what is, um, how other people are finding these things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and that must be so difficult with these constantly shifting mechanisms and like these, these adapted exhibitions. Um, you know, you're not gonna have the same the same questions, the same feedback, and you go from one exhibition with, like you said, 138 minutes of film 
um, to another one with nearly none. I mean, it's yeah, that seems like like quite a bit to assess, and you really have to do it. Can't necessarily just use numbers for that. Yeah, I mean, we get with word of mouth, you get very the feedback's very mm. fast. So you, but it's it's not. But I'd be interested to know how other people measure. What other what are the other mechanisms for measuring success? Is mm -hmm. something I would be interested in. Yeah, doing more research about. Yeah, and I think we might actually discuss that in the future because there have been a few um, sort of discussions on listservs in various places about self-assessment and also, you know, the the survey culture and that sort of thing. So that I think that would actually be really interesting. Um, and we're going to have an upcoming talk with someone who does. Um, adapted exhibitions for MFAs that are done as residencies. Um, so I'm hoping to get in touch with someone about that, and I think that would be really interesting to have someone else that does these constantly shifting sites where you have to set up exhibitions in a completely new place, often outdoors, um, and see, yeah, how she does that with her completely different exhibitions every time. It's also a learning thing, because in, um, in the UK, the Arts Council is is the main funding body that all of pretty much all of the nonprofits will feed in and out of the arts council in different ways at different times and there's a very um established criteria for how they feel one should measure success of a non-profit organization so i'm still on a big learning curve of what it means to think about that within a university to think about that within america um and to think about that with um with my peers um because it's not i've never really looked at a program of assessment that feels right but at the same time it's really it's always been very useful in the uk to have had that as a guideline so for us that was particularly when i ran freeze foundation the arts council really helped me um create an incredible pedagogical program alongside the commissioning platform and and sort of was gave me the like gave me the sort of uh the extra uh uh was yeah was it enabled me to ring fence money for things mm -hmm. that i'm very passionate about um so yeah it, and as uh chung yo uh just just said on the side it, it probably has to do with who's asking for assessment data so a lot of the fundraising will ask they'll ask for very specific things or the more you do fundraising you learn that there are certain types of assessment that are um, that they might expect, even if they don't tell you outright. So I think I feel like that's a huge influencer on assessment. It's not just self-assessment, but assessment for funding agencies. And with us, we're very connected with the faculty at Steinhardt. So for us, it's not there is a, we don't have a board in that sense because we're part of the university, and then because you know NYU is very complex. We get a lot of feedback from sort of other incredible. Um, we also collaborate with the IFA. I mean, NYU has so many. We, we do collaborate with Tish <laughs> um, and um, and Gallatin, and obviously Gray does all this incredible stuff. So for us, there's, there is there's a constant feedback loop, mm -hmm. um, and we are always sort of putting that information into our future planning. Um, but also for us in terms of in England, it was always very traditional that there's, there was a huge focus on audience numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And often at, here in a way for us, someone might, we might have less people in a day, but they might spend more time here. They might be participating and coming every week, or they might just come for one exhibition. Like, so for us, for audience engagement, it's so hard to quantify mm -hmm. and just otherwise you're just focused on how many people are coming through the door rather than why they're here, how they um, experience what we're doing and and what kind of long-term effect that has on um, whether it's like building student confidence. You know, there are all these things. Um, also, because the way we function doesn't also fit into a traditional academic, even though we're part of the department and there are classes that fit into what an academic criteria of success would look like for a student or for a for a class structure 
we're we're trying to be a space where that can be thought through in different ways, and sometimes like pilot new ideas potentially as well. So, yeah, like this online <laughs> interactions and um, conversations. It's the first time I've done anything like this, so it's great. It's oh, great. wonderful! I'm glad to hear it. Well, we are coming up to just a little over an hour. You yeah. are so fantastic, Nicola, the wealth of knowledge. Uh, one last question for you. What have you learned by making the switch to a more academic environment from outside of this realm? I am still thinking about that. Um, I, it's, um, I think particularly in, uh, in New York City, it's like, and, and where we are next to the gray, like this is, it's such a vibrant um, and exciting and dynamic space for us. Um, you know, with with a lot of the things that have come up today, there are, like we, we are constantly asking ourselves these questions and re thinking about how um, contemporary art can remain a relevant conversation, you know, with our immediate community, which is NYU, with the city and, and a more of our international or um partnerships um and i think it, it's a very complicated one i mean i really only came, my background i really worked for organizations that, uh, where the uh, primary focus solo focus was contemporary maybe a little bit of modern art but mainly contemporary art so for me and, and within those organizations i would often out, do outreach and collaborate with um harvard university or um, Princeton, or I would collaborate with um, all sorts of different organizations, but um, this is the first time that I've been part of a community that's not necessarily primarily focused on contemporary art. So for us, even, but it's a huge community. So for us, that's the thing that we're always trying to think about. And, um, and for us, the, the academic community brings in so many conversations and voices and resources. Um, and I think um, that's really like the heart and the life of the space. Um, but at the same time, we're wanting to sort of be as ambitious as all the other contemporary art or modern art galleries and um, universities where we're wanting to also be on the cutting edge of like the international conversation of like what it means to work with artists, make new work and also make new work in this very fragile and complex moment. Um, and I think that for me, moving here, summer 2016, being part of the university was was a, the, the sort of the incredible mechanism that we were able to have these very complex and difficult conversations. And I feel like that has been the main, um, the yeah, is, is a constant gift really from NYU. That is, is, is your peer group, the professors, the faculty, the staff at NYU are just so incredible and the students. But it's it's always enabling us to be as discursive without having to even like overly program and overly sort of organize groups. It sort of happened quite organically. So my favorite thing is when people just come and eat their lunch in the gallery because that's that's <laughs> like yeah. That's I can't I can't see a lot of uh, folks saying that necessarily. Uh, yeah, you can bring your dogs. Like, <laughs> We're not precious about this stuff. That's that's where I, we are. At, yeah, our happiest. Okay. Well, Nicola, it was absolutely wonderful talking to you. Um, and Laura, thank you so much for navigating all of this um, and being being a bright and vibrant programs assistant. Um, Hi, and Laura. yeah, Nicola, I hope we'll be in touch. Um, I'll like I'd like to get some of the resources from you that we discussed earlier. And we can share those on the site and have some more discussions in the future. I think that would yeah. be wonderful. And if anyone's in town, the show we have up at the moment is on till 7th of September, which is really exciting. And then the next exhibition is, is a performance exhibition, which is October 10th till November 3rd, I think. And it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every week for five hours. So, oh, wow. And okay. And the, and the exhibition is live. So it, it's, it's, it doesn't have a beginning and an end, but, um, and that's the Atlas Unlimited project we were talking about with um, Karthik Pandian and um, Andrew Brown. So it's an opera. So we're really excited. So anyone we can invite, any way we can like share that to the community. We always love to, um, yeah, host people for coffee or different things. Yes, please come see us in New York. Great. 
And you said you have programming on Wednesday nights, correct? We have a smaller project space. So during the semester time, we have openings every Wednesday night um, in that space. Um, and then with the next exhibition, so there'll be an opening on Wednesday and then the performances are Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, so I look forward to coming to one. Too. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. And I'll, yeah, see you all soon, hopefully. Yes, wonderful. Well, thank you very much. This was fantastic. Thank you. Yes. Well, maybe, hopefully. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs>